This week, 24 years ago, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated after a rally for peace in Tel Aviv. His death ended the euphoria around a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and still reverberates in the current Israeli political crisis. A deeper dive coming up now. I'm Lev Gringaus, and welcome to The Jews Are Tired, your podcast about Jewish news. So let's talk about Rabin and why it's important to still be talking about Rabin 24 years after his assassination. So Yitzhak Rabin was born in Jerusalem in 1922, right at the beginning of the British Mandate of Palestine, and served in the ragtag Jewish army that would become the Israeli Defense Forces once Israel was declared a state in May of 1948. Over the course of the next half a century, Rabin was chief of staff of the IDF during the Six-Day War, an ambassador to the United States, prime minister and minister of defense, and most famously was elected as prime minister again in 1992, leading the left-wing Labour Party, historically of David Ben-Gurion and Golda Meir. Rabin, though he had been a military man most of his life, believed in taking steps to negotiate with Palestinian leadership to reach a peace settlement and a two-state solution. So in the early 1990s, that's what he did in a process that became the Oslo Accords, which were the series of agreements in which Israel would slowly grant Palestinians full autonomy to create a state as long as leading Palestinian organizations recognized the right of Israel to exist and cut down on terror attacks. Now, Israelis by the 1990s had lived through wars and all sorts of terror attacks, and not just stuff that we've all heard about, like the Six-Day War in 1967 or the Yom Kippur War in 1973, but also the first Lebanon War that began in the early 1980s as Israel invaded southern Lebanon to chase out Palestinian terrorist groups. Israel only withdrew from South Lebanon in the year 2000, and the first Lebanon war left many Israelis with a feeling of, what the hell were we doing there for 20 years? Particularly as the Palestinian groups already left Lebanon after 1982. In 1987 came the first Palestinian Intifada, in which Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank began a mass uprising, or rioting, or protests, or violence, or nonviolent resistance against Israeli control. Look, in reality, there was a combination of all of these responses during that time, from violent to nonviolent. But as with all Israeli Palestinian history, everyone has their name for what happened. And during this time, it was in fact Yitzhak Rabin who cracked down on Palestinians with an iron fist policy in which many more Palestinians than Israelis were injured and killed to shut down the Intifada. And during all of this time, terror attacks on Israeli civilians continued, as they had been going on long before the Intifada or the First Lebanon War. So then, Yitzhak Rabin becomes prime minister and makes progress, at least on paper, for peace with the Palestinians, hoping to negotiate his way to security for Israel and Israelis by way of a two-state solution. In one speech to American Jews, he said, quote, One hand we will outstretch in peace, the other we will keep poised on the trigger. We will live in peace and not with illusions, end quote. But then it all fell apart. After incitement by right-wing Israeli politicians, including by current Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, an extremist Jewish Israeli shot and killed Rabin on November 4th, 1995, as he left a peace rally in Tel Aviv. Palestinian groups who opposed the Oslo Accords ramped up terror attacks to get Israel to back out of negotiations, and right-wing Netanyahu was elected in 1996 for his first term, where he both slowed down the peace negotiations and continued negotiating under pressure from the United States. In 1999, Netanyahu left office, and then Ehud Barak, a left-winger, became prime minister promising to save the peace negotiations. So just to boil down all of that whiplash... Rabin, a left-wing politician, is assassinated. So a right-winger gets elected, and then the pendulum swings again to a left-winger. It was a mess, and at that time, the Oslo Accords were basically dead in the water. And then, the Second Intifada, or Palestinian Uprising, erupts in 2001, when Israeli buses and cafes regularly get blown up by Palestinian suicide bombers until 2005. And after that violence... 
Israelis no longer trust peace negotiations with the Palestinians, and the left wing of Rabin and the hopes for peace vanish, opening the door to a generation of right-wing Israeli governments led for the past decade by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And now we reach the present day, as Netanyahu is unable to form a majority governing coalition of political parties in the Israeli Knesset, which means there's no Israeli government, and he may not continue to be prime minister. And neither can his rival, former Israeli chief of staff, Benny Gantz, form a government. Today, Israel is a place where young voters who grew up in the Second Intifada are overwhelmingly right-wing and anti-peace negotiations, and the older generation of voters, including most of the generals and security experts, are Rabin-style left-wingers. And all of this history lies underneath much of the current political tension in Israel, and why Netanyahu has been so quick to label Gantz as left-wing. It's easy to evoke the failure of peace negotiations and the terror of the Second Intifada to make the case against Gantz, and in some ways it doesn't help that Gantz has been meeting with the Arab-Israeli political parties while trying to form an Israeli government. The last time the Arab-Israeli party supported a prime minister, it was Rabin, where they were, in fact, in the governing coalition. That's not a situation likely to happen with Gantz, as a coalition with the Arab-Israeli parties is basically political suicide, but it is noteworthy that he isn't ignoring Arab-Israelis either. At the same time, Gantz hasn't spoken at all about a two-state solution or peace negotiations with the Palestinians, but he was front and center at the rally to remember Yitzhak Rabin earlier this week, talking about the need to bridge societal divides. How much of a Rabin Gantz will end up being depends entirely on whether or not Gantz even becomes prime minister, which seems unlikely given current Israeli political deadlock. Either way, the tension over the legitimacy of Israel's political left after the failures of the peace process continues to make its mark. This has been this week's The Jews Are Tired podcast. I'm Lev Gringaus. Don't forget to subscribe and share, and hopefully next week, The Jews will get some rest. The Jews Are Tired is a product of Jewfolk, Inc. For more information, go to tcjewfolk.com or email the show at podcast at tcjewfolk.com.